It's now my pleasure, pleasure to introduce today's keynote. As Deputy Attorney General, Rod Rosenstein advises and assists Attorney General Jeff Sessions in formulating and implementing Department of Justice policies and programs. He also helps in providing overall supervision to all organizational units of the Department of Justice. As such, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein was responsible for appointing Robert Mueller earlier this year as the special counsel in charge of investigating Russia's involvement in the 2016 presidential election. He also currently oversees the ongoing investigation. Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein has spent more than 27 years in government service. After graduating from the Wharton School of Business and Harvard Law School, he started his legal career as a law clerk to Judge Douglas H. Ginsburg of the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein began his career, oh, sorry, that was in there twice. <laughs> that was in there twice, my bad. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, <laughs> Deputy Colonel Rod Rosenstein. Well, thank you, Tony, for that uh, gracious introduction, and thank you for keeping it brief. You should feel free to do it twice, <laughs> as long as it's short. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the members of the Forum Club for inviting me to join you in Palm Beach today. Uh, I particularly I want to express my gratitude to Bruce Reinhardt. Uh, Bruce was introduced as a lawyer, which is true, but he is also going to be the next federal magistrate judge here in Palm Beach. Congratulations, Bruce. <laughs> and I'm glad to see that my good friend Alex Acosta, who served with me as a U.S. attorney in the Bush administration, is going to be here as your speaker next month. It was snowing uh, when I left Maryland yesterday, when I arrived in Florida, somebody commented that it was unseasonably cold. I didn't notice. <laughs> and I am wearing my socks, Tony. <laughs> Yesterday, I hosted a forum about human trafficking at your local U.S. Attorney's Office. The human trafficking, as you know, is a very serious issue. The local newspaper printed a story about it. The headline reads, Rosenstein visits Miami and does not talk about Russia. You'll be able to write the same headline here in Palm Beach today, I can assure you. When my teenage daughter first learned that I was going to be Deputy Attorney General, she asked me whether my picture would be in the newspaper. Because when you're 15, that's one of the most exciting things that can happen, is to get your picture in the newspaper. And I told her, no. I said, Deputy Attorney General is a low-profile job. Bruce and I have known several of the Deputy Attorneys General. Nobody knows the Deputy Attorney General. Well, those were the days. <laughs> but I'm very happy to be here for several reasons. For one thing, I always appreciate the opportunity to spend a few hours outside of our nation's capital. D.C. is a great place to work, but it's no day at the beach. President Harry Truman said that if you want a friend in our nation's capital, you should get a dog. <laughs> I'm very lucky. I already have a dog. I've seen stories speculating that I may be sued, fired, or held in contempt. And that is just the past 24 hours. <laughs> My father called me and asked, are you OK? And I said, yes, I had a great day. And he said, really? <laughs> well, my parents grew up in a time when news happened twice a day once in the morning newspaper, and once in the evening network broadcast. There were only a few suppliers of news. Most people accepted the news as gospel truth, and usually it was true. In those days, facts were different than opinions. Newspapers and television networks labeled their opinions as editorials, and they made efforts to distinguish between the news and the opinions. It wasn't a perfect system. The line between fact and opinion was blurry sometimes, but there was a line. Now, the truth is, yesterday really was a great day for me. It was a great day because I spent it working with exceptional public servants, 
at the United States Department of Justice and with state and local law enforcement officials who are protecting you here in Florida. We spent the day helping to protect our nation and promote the rule of law. And I'm proud to work for a president and an attorney general who support our efforts to achieve those goals. I'm also honored to work with your state attorney general, Pam Bondi, who is a strong advocate for the rule of law. Today I want to speak about the importance of the rule of law and how the American constitutional structure protects it. Our Constitution establishes a government based on the principle that the law must be enforced fairly and applied evenly to all persons. But the rule of law is not just about words. Even the most eloquent written rules require interpretation. And because decisions need to be made, the rule of law depends on the character of the people who are charged with enforcing it. If the people who enforce the law uphold it faithfully, the result will be a high degree of predictability and stability. That stability provided by the rule of law is one of the reasons why our nation has thrived. When you follow the rule of law, it doesn't mean that you will always be happy with the outcome. To the contrary, you know for sure that you're following the rule of law when you are not always happy with the outcome. The rule of law permits the public to hold people accountable for violating rules set in place by elected officials. It also protects people from arbitrary government actions and arbitrary punishments by requiring officials to follow fair processes before depriving anybody of their life, liberty, or property. One of the finest defenses of the rule of law appears in Robert Bolt's brilliant play about Sir Thomas More, A Man for All Seasons. In the play, More defends the rule of law in an argument with his son-in-law, William Roper. Roper is angry because Moore says that he would allow the devil the benefit of the protection of the rule of law. Roper insists that he would cut down every law, if necessary, in order to destroy the devil. And Moore replies, oh. And when the last law was down and the devil turned round on you, where would you hide, Roper? The law is all being flat. And Moore concludes, I would give the devil the benefit of law for my own safety's sake. Moore's point is that we need to defend the rule of law, even when it is not to our personal interest, so that it will be there for us when we need it. German theologian Martin Niemöller made a similar point. Niemöller failed to defend the rule of law, and he later regretted it. He explained that when they came for me, there was no one left to speak up. The founders of our nation understood the importance of the rule of law. That's why the president and all officers are required to take an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. President Abraham Lincoln spoke about the oath of office in his first inaugural address. By the time Lincoln was inaugurated in 1861, the slave states had already begun to secede from the Union. Lincoln explained in his address that after swearing an oath to defend the government, he could never accept its destruction. Lincoln's primary concern was about geography, the unity of the American states. But Lincoln also talked about another kind of unity that's important to you. He spoke about the unity of the American people. And Lincoln's words resonate today. Partisan differences are exacerbated by the news media. Opposing parties, they tell us, are at war, figuratively. But in Lincoln's time, people were at war literally. Differences of opinion then were far deeper than any differences today. But nonetheless, Lincoln insisted that his opponents not be treated as enemies because they were all Americans. Lincoln said that we are not enemies but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. Lincoln invoked the mystic chords of memory that tie our people together. And he concluded his speech by appealing to the better angels of our nature. A shared commitment to the rule of law is a bond that ties Americans together through the generations. In 1951, 90 years after Lincoln's address, Judge Learned Hand said, 
that if we are to keep our democracy, there must be one commandment, thou shalt not ration justice. At the Department of Justice, our 115,000 employees work tirelessly to faithfully discharge the duties of their office. Priorities change, but the principles of the Department of Justice are timeless. We will defend those principles, and we will pass them on to future generations. One of the most important things we do is to enforce the laws wisely and justly. Faithful execution of the law requires discretion and sound judgment. One of our nation's great attorneys general was Robert Jackson. In 1940, he gave a classic speech about the role of the prosecutor. Jackson said that a prosecutor should play fair and follow the rules. That's not surprising. But Jackson also explained that prosecutors should temper zeal with kindness, serve the law rather than partisan interests, and approach the task with humility. At the Department of Justice, we must always pursue justice, and justice must be based on truth. The truth, as I learned from Bruce when we were putting together my first case, truth is about credible evidence, not strong opinions. Many people sincerely believe things that just aren't true. In the words of a 19th century Philadelphia doctor, sincerity of belief is not the test of truth. That's why it's important for us to avoid confirmation bias. People who seek the truth need to remain open to the possibility that it may not match their preconceptions. Fair-minded investigators must never reach a conclusion first because it causes them to ignore contradictory facts. President John Adams famously observed that facts are stubborn things. And whatever may be our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passions, they cannot, enter, they cannot alter the state of the facts and evidence. Adams, incidentally, was a trial lawyer. Now, pursuing truth means always yielding to facts, even if they run contrary to our expectations. One of the ways that we protect the truth-seeking process in our legal system is that investigators and prosecutors do not get to decide which facts are true. Allegations made by a prosecutor are presumed not to be true in court. So when we make an allegation, we need to be prepared to prove it. Now, sometimes people look at the high conviction rate of criminals in our federal courts and mistakenly assume that the job is easy. But the opposite is true. Conviction rates are high because federal prosecutors exercise great care before they allege wrongdoing. We need to introduce documents that satisfy strict rules of admissibility. Our witnesses must be credible under cross-examination. We need to rebut any exculpatory evidence offered by the defense. And we must prove our case to the unanimous satisfaction of 12 randomly selected citizens. Now consider how difficult it is to get 12 random citizens to agree on anything. We need to persuade them all. If a defendant persuades just one juror that we're wrong, the presumption of innocence carries the day. Now, those requirements deter most prosecutors from making frivolous allegations. In the play about Sir Thomas More that I mentioned earlier, there's a humorous scene that illustrates the need for solid evidence. Thomas More and his family are discussing whether More should prosecute a man just because they do not like him. And More's wife says, arrest him. And More replies, for what? And More's daughter says, father, that man is bad. And More goes on to explain it as a judicial officer. He must be concerned about what is legal and not about what is right. What is right is a subjective opinion. What is legal is an objective issue of fact and law. Now, there are two baseline objective requirements for criminal prosecution. First, the alleged conduct must unambiguously violate the law. The second, the evidence must unambiguously prove the alleged conduct. I refer to those as baseline requirements because in America, we do not prosecute every violation of the law. We make a subjective determination about whether the violation warrants prosecution in light of all the relevant facts and circumstances known to the prosecutor. So discretion is inherent in law enforcement. To quote Judge Richard Posner, 
The Department of Justice wields enormous power over people's lives, much of it beyond judicial or political review. With power comes responsibility, moral if not legal, for its prudent and restrained exercise. And responsibility implies knowledge, experience, and sound judgment, not just good faith. That point is made more concisely in a remark attributed to French Enlightenment philosopher Voltaire. With great power comes great responsibility. If that quote sounds familiar, it was also said by another legendary person, Spider-Man's Uncle Ben. <laughs> and Tony whispered it. Now my point about solemn responsibility is that the Department of Justice does not measure success solely by whether we acted with the right motive. Government officials who exercise discretion have a special obligation to make the right choice based on articulable reasons that explain why a case is treated in a particular way. And that requires experience, good judgment, and wisdom. One of the long-standing principles of the Department of Justice is that we try not to make any public comments about things that are not already in the public record. Now, there are many reasons for that policy. One is that it may interfere with our investigations if people learn the details about them. Another is that it may be unfair to the people who are not charged with crimes. Because when we make allegations of wrongdoing, our allegations are given considerable weight in the arena of public opinion, even though they're presumed not to be true in a court of law. Now, lots of people are allowed to talk to reporters about federal investigations. Witnesses are allowed to talk to reporters. Suspects are allowed to talk to reporters. Private lawyers are allowed to talk to reporters. And all of those people have friends who also are allowed to talk to reporters. One of the consequences is that the people who do talk to reporters usually do not know all the relevant facts. So the stories frequently are wrong in either stark or subtle ways. The mistakes sometimes reveal to us that the source probably was not one of the officials conducting the investigation. Let me turn to one of the most important structural protections established by our Constitution. In theory, there's a division of labor in our federal government. Each of the three branches plays a vital role in upholding the rule of law. The legislature's role is to enact the law. The executive branch implements the law, and the judicial branch interprets the law. But our framers did not want any branch to be entirely independent. The system includes checks and balances. Each branch is subject to some degree of influence and control by the two other branches. Now, the framers believed that that interdependence of the branches was essential to preserve the liberty that they literally fought to establish. The most challenging thing about our system of checks and balances is that the lines between the branches are not self-executing. Each branch has the power to overstep the lines and interfere with the other branches. There's no umpire who sits above the three branches to resolve disputes. The system, therefore, requires good faith and humility because each branch sometimes needs to defer to the authority of the other branches, even if it does not like the decision. Conflicts arise when there are disagreements about which branch should exercise humility in a particular circumstance. Now, I want to be clear that humility requires acquiescence, not endorsement. When I speak of respecting the separation of powers and demonstrating institutional humility, I do not mean to suggest that it's wrong to criticize. There are certain ethical restrictions on judges and lawyers, but members of the executive and legislative branches are free to critique the policy choices of the other branches. Principal differences of opinion help to challenge assumptions and promote better decisions. They promote decisions that are based on full information. So expressions of disagreement really help to keep everybody honest. When the president and members of the Congress are unhappy with the policy choices of the other branches, they're free to express their disagreement. But judges are not supposed to do that. Because judges are not politically accountable. They do not need to stand for election. Judges are bound by ethical restrictions. So a judge who dislikes the Trump administration's policies 
about vetting foreign visitors or funding sanctuary cities, for example, is still supposed to uphold the policy if it is legal without expressing any opinion about whether or not the judge believes it's a good policy choice. That is challenging for some judges because many people presume that the judge must agree with the substantive outcome when in fact the judge generally is not supposed to care about the outcome. Supreme Court Justice John Roberts explained that it's best to view the judge as an umpire. A good umpire does not care which side wins. As long as the umpire makes the right decisions in calling balls and strikes, people do not hold the umpire responsible for who wins or loses. But in litigation, there's no scorekeeping. The judge has a duty to declare which side wins. So it is sometimes difficult to distinguish the process from the substantive outcome. But judges are supposed to respect the president's policy choices, as long as the choice is consistent with constitutional and statutory law. Under the leadership of Attorney General Jeff Sessions, the executive branch respects the other branches of government and avoids encroaching on their functions. For example, Attorney General Sessions recently announced that the department will no longer take actions that have the effect of adopting new regulatory requirements or amending the law. Congress has given executive agencies the ability to issue regulations or to make rules in particular subject areas, but only if the agencies follow a congressionally approved process. Our policy change arose from Associate Attorney General Rachel Brand's efforts to pursue regulatory reform. Jesse Panuccio, a Floridian who is here with us today, is working closely with General Brand on that regulatory reform. From now on, I will not usurp Congress's job of making rules. We'll stick with enforcing the rules. Another example of our commitment not to encroach on Congress's role is the termination of third-party settlement practices. Our department often negotiates settlements with companies that are accused of wrongdoing. That money that we collect should go to the victims who were harmed by the wrongful conduct. If any money is left over after the victims are reimbursed, the remainder belongs to the American people. Attorney General Sessions therefore ordered our department to stop supplanting Congress's role, to stop exercising the power of the purse by using the threat of prosecution to appropriate money from private defendants and direct it to favored interest groups. It's Congress's job to decide how to spend the government's money. It's not the prosecutor's job. Those policy changes implement the rule of law. Those are process decisions, not substantive decisions. Well, I don't have time to discuss every one of our department's priorities. But let me use a few remaining minutes to talk about violent crime and illegal drugs. The violent crime rate in America declined steadily for about 20 years. Unfortunately, in 2014, the decline came to an abrupt halt. And over the next two years, America suffered a stark increase in violence. Many of you were not affected, but I was in Baltimore and many of my fellow residents in Baltimore were very much affected, as were people in Chicago and other major American cities. In 2015 and 2016, the violent crime rate jumped by about 7%. And in Baltimore, this year, 2017, it just concluded, Baltimore experienced the highest murder rate in history, in the history of Baltimore. The murders skyrocketed nationally by over 20% during that two-year period. And when violent crime is out of control and people are afraid to leave their homes, that community is not governed by the rule of law. And drug overdose deaths also surged in recent years, and I suspect that many of you and your families have been affected in some way by that. In 1990, there were about 8,000 overdose deaths in America. Last year, 64,000 Americans lost their lives to drug overdoses. Drug overdose is now the leading cause of death for Americans under the age of 50. Those statistics are facts, not opinions. Now, President Trump responded to those heartbreaking facts by directing the Department of Justice to support state and local law enforcement and work with them to restore public safety for all Americans. 85% of our law enforcement officers in the United States are state, local, and tribal, not federal officers. And the Attorney General recognizes that we need to support those partners 
if we want to reduce crime. He directed our department to conduct a review and to ensure that we fully and effectively promote a positive relationship with all of our law enforcement partners. As the national leader of law enforcement, the Attorney General has a role to play in promoting confidence of law enforcement officers and of building public confidence in law enforcement. We also provided more than $207 million in grants to support state, local, and tribal law enforcement and violent crime reduction efforts across the country. And I spoke with some of the law enforcement leaders here in Southern Florida yesterday about how that funding is enhancing their ability to fight crime in your neighborhoods. Our department also reinvigorated the Project Safe Neighborhoods program by improving and updating the original program that went into effect in 2001. It's a nationwide strategy to reduce violent crime by tasking our U.S. attorneys to work cooperatively with our partners and use all available tools to make our streets safe again. That's a strategy that Alex and I worked with uh, in the Bush administration and had an impact here in Florida as it did in my home state of Maryland. And we launched the Public Safety Partnership, which provides extra assistance to places that are experiencing high levels of crime or a precipitous increase in violence. In addition to that, we're hiring more federal prosecutors. And thanks to federal hiring grants, more police officers will patrol the streets. I want to speak for a moment about those police officers. America is the home of the brave. It's the home of the free, in part because it's the home of the brave. And one of the highlights of my job is the chance to work with courageous law enforcement officers throughout the country. When I arrived uh, on stage here today, I noticed the club motto on the wall behind me, stimulate thought, promote dialogue. Mr. President, I approve that message. And I commend you for adopting it. And I look forward to your questions. So let me conclude now, as President Lincoln did in his inaugural address and consistent with your club motto, with the hope and the prayer that nonpartisan forums like this one will help us all to remember our shared bonds of affection and always to be guided by the better angels of our nature. Thank you very much. Our first questions come from our students. If the student from Oxbridge would please stand up and introduce yourself and ask your question. Now you may need to shout. Now, I apologize, I didn't hear the entire question, but my understanding is she'd asked about recent criticism of the department uh, and whether or not uh, that justifies a conclusion that there's some partisanship in the department. And if I understood it properly, the answer is absolutely not. Uh, as Bruce uh, and his wife, Carolyn Bell, who's still a federal prosecutor here in Southern Florida, can attest, that's just not the way we do business in the Department of Justice. You know, we have people who have political opinions. Uh, but we have processes in place to make sure that those opinions don't influence their conduct. And those processes include levels of supervisory review and the culture of our U.S. attorney's offices, uh, which simply do not permit partisanship to enter into the decisions. And that's not to say that people don't make mistakes. You know, we had some publicity recently about some uh, agents who reportedly uh, were making partisan comments while they were at work. Um, and certainly things like that happen, but the processes that we have in place are designed to ensure that that does not impact the substantive results. So we can be criticized. People are free to criticize our department. Uh, but 
we're going to make sure that we follow the rules and principles. We consider criticism, there's nothing wrong with that, taking into consideration uh, how things are perceived, but we need to make sure that we're comfortable with our internal processes. And just about anybody who has actually worked in the Department of Justice uh, can explain to you how these principles and processes work and why I'm so confident that in almost every case they're going to be effective. And one of the reasons I am so confident is because when people violate the rules, we hold them accountable. We have internal watchdogs who actually work within the Department of Justice and have access to all of our files. We have an Office of Inspector General, and we have an Office of Professional Responsibility. And when they receive an allegation that somebody in the Department of Justice is engaged in misconduct, they do not cover it up. They are actually very tough and very aggressive and very independent, uh, and they have the right to pursue that evidence uh, and review all of our files. We don't want anything back from our internal investigators, the Inspector General and the uh, Director of the Office of Professional Responsibility. And so those internal checks uh, are a guarantee of propriety. In addition to that, they're external checks. Our lawyers are subject to bar rules. So if they were to do something improper, they actually could lose their license to practice law. And of course, there's congressional oversight. Um, and so you know, Congress, if they believe there is some uh, possibility something went wrong, they have the ability to come in uh, and investigate our files and call our folks uh, to testify. So as a result of all that, uh, I have a high degree of confidence in the department. First, because of the integrity of the people, and second, because of the checks and balances, both internal and external, uh, to the department. And I, I hope I fully answered your question. I apologize I didn't hear it all, but if the microphone's working, we'll, we'll take another one. Yeah. The student from, the, <clears throat> from Florida Atlantic University would introduce yourself and ask your question. Yes, uh, Mr. Deputy Attorney General, thank you for coming and spending time with us today. Uh, my name is Michael Kyra. I'm a student at Florida Atlantic University. My question for you is, as a former nominee for the federal bench, how would you assess the confirmation process, and would you like to see some changes in that process? <laughs> okay, so I want to answer that question without regard to my personal experience. Um, but I should tell you, I mean, I have no ill will about this. I was nominated for a federal judgeship uh, in 2007 and not confirmed, and that's fine. That's process. In order to become a federal judge, you need to be nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate. You need both. You know, one of the two is not enough. It's all or nothing. Uh, and so that's a fair process. Uh, you know, and there are political considerations that go into the Senate's evaluation in some cases. Uh, you know, the process is, is designed that way. So I have no hard feelings about it. But I do have a critique uh, of the process. And my critique, my criticism of the process, not just for judges, but particularly for executive branch officials, people who staff the Department of Justice and our federal agencies, is it takes too long to get through the process. Now again, people are gonna be rejected, and if they're gonna be rejected, uh, it might as well take forever. But if people are unobjectionable, then there's no excuse for this process being delayed. And so when I see things you know, like a, a senator's upset about something completely unrelated to our nominee, and so they say they're gonna punish the nominees, you know, these are people like you, people who are in private businesses, who have agreed to set aside their, their private interests, in most cases to take pay cuts. It's disrupted their lives, they can't make commitments to clients, and they're required to make, wait months and months and months, even though they're ultimately going to get confirmed. So my view about that is that the process would be much better if we could find a quicker way to get to the conclusion. People are going to vote against them, fine, but let's get to that point and not force these people to sit in limbo because it's unfair to them. And it's uh, actually for practical purposes, just to share my personal interest in this, it's particularly disruptive for me. We have no assistant attorney general in our national security division. Now that division is responsible for protecting America from terrorism, our number one priority. And our nominee uh, is a man who is exceptionally experienced. His name is John Demers. And he is exceptionally experienced. He, he's not partisan, he wants to do the right thing and do this job, uh, and he has not been confirmed. And uh, there's no explanation, no legitimate explanation for why somebody like that can't get on the job. And, and the, my practical, my personal interest in this is there are only three officials in the Department of Justice who are authorized to sign Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act applications. We sign the application, federal judges make a determination of whether or not the warrant should be issued. But there are three officials in the Department of Justice the Attorney General, the Deputy Attorney General, and the Assistant Attorney General for the National Security Division in that order. And whoever's there and is lowest in the totem pole spends a half hour of their day signing those warrants. So the Attorney General did it. 
uh, from February through April, and I've been doing it from April through January. And when John gets there, I'm going to have an extra half hour every day. And there are lots of things that I can do with that time. So you know, that's my personal stake. But again, the more important issue is it just isn't fair to these people. And if they're going to be rejected as I was, no hard feelings, let's get that over with. But if they're going to get confirmed, let's just find a way to get it done. Thank you. So we Does anybody agree with me on that? <laughs> How could you not? We have way more questions than we'll be able to get to, but we'll just start out with an easy one. Um, in your testimony in front of the House Judiciary Committee, you declined to discuss the specifics of the Mueller investigation. That's because I was waiting for this opportunity. That's <laughs> so thank you for asking. So can you comment on the process. As citizens, how do we know that there isn't bias in either direction? Mm -hmm. Okay, now that's a very good question. And it's a legitimate question. How do we know there isn't bias in either direction? Now, I'm not going to talk about the Mueller investigation. I'm going to talk about law enforcement in general. I'm going to talk about the kind of work that Bruce Reinhardt and Carolyn Bell and I uh, have done for most of our careers. Um, so we're charged with investigating a case. Uh, how do you know there isn't bias? Well, there are two possible biases. Let's say there's a bias in favor of the person you're investigating or a bias against the person you're investigating. The bias in favor of the person you're investigating presumably would lead you not to prosecute them. The way we, we know that, you're not going to know anything publicly because there's no prosecution, there's no test. But we do have our internal checks. So you ask yourself, who's the supervisor? And who's that person's supervisor? And who's that person's supervisor? What's the chain of command? Because there's no situation where one person in the Department of Justice is making a decision without oversight. So that's the first question you ask. Uh, and then you ask, well, what kind of external review is there? If I find some evidence of uh, bias, what's going to be done about it? You know, are they going to investigate themselves? And the answer is, yes, we do. We have our Inspector General, our Office of Professional Responsibility. They read the newspapers. They read every letter of complaint that comes in. They look at the evidence, and they make an independent determination about whether to investigate. So that's the check on bias in favor. Of, uh, and I should add, actually, that it's not only is it not just one person, the teams include police and prosecutors, agents and prosecutors. So you've got people with chains of command on both sides uh, that are check on that. The other question is, well, what if they're biased against the person they're investigating? You know, what if they bring a charge that's not justified by the evidence? Okay, would one of the students like to tell me what happens? If we bring a charge that's not justified by the evidence, we get embarrassed in court because we're not going to be able to prove that case beyond any reasonable doubt to the satisfaction of a unanimous jury of 12 people and uh, of a judge. Uh, and so those are the checks. Uh, and so because we conduct them in secret, because that's a good thing, we don't want TV cameras in our offices while we're conducting investigations. People aren't able to come in and watch what we do, but they can judge the outcome. Uh, and so that is the assurance, not just what I tell you, what Bruce and Carolyn and all of our other federal prosecutors tell you. Uh, it's uh, the processes, and of course the track record. Look at the people who are making those decisions. You know, look at the career prosecutors and the career agents and the supervisors and the U.S. attorneys and the DOJ officials who have to go through that Senate confirmation. You know, one good thing about the process is they don't miss anything. Right? That's a pretty thorough process. And so that's the check uh, that you have against bias impacting our work. Our government has concluded that Russia weaponized social media and attacked our democratic process. What's the prescription to protect our democracy? Okay, Tony, you remember what I said about the headline today. <clears throat> um, so let me talk generally about that. That's a very important question. And th that's a, a, probably one of the most important questions. What do we do to protect American democracy? And the answer is we have a lot of people who are working to protect American democracy from foreign threats. That's what this FISA process is all about. Uh, we have uh, uh, agents within the FBI, and then we have other intelligence agencies in Washington that have other responsibilities. And since 9-11, the government has really beefed up that uh, area. And so you have people like uh, uh, Director Rogers and Director Coates and Director Pompeo uh, who are responsible for monitoring national security, for identifying threats and for responding to threats. Uh, much of that, most of that happens out of the public eye. It's highly classified. Occasionally there will be issues that come to public attention 
but, uh, but there's a lot, there are a lot of good people, uh, and a lot of work is going into confronting those threats and, and responding to those threats. How does the uh, DOJ plan to criminalize uh, state-sanctioned medical marijuana dispensaries, how is that going to change now? So that's a very topical question. Somebody's been reading the news. Uh, there was an announcement yesterday about a change in department policy. And uh, let me explain. This, for us, is a rule of law issue. Now, the Attorney General's made very clear that he personally believes that marijuana is a dangerous substance. That's a very common view. There's there are differences of opinion about it. Uh, that, that's a, a decision about the merits of whether or not you think marijuana should or shouldn't be legal. And you're free to have an opinion about that. But I talked earlier about the difference between facts and opinions. The facts are that the United States Congress has decreed that marijuana is unlawful throughout these United States of America, every one of the 50 states. And no state or local government has the authority to overrule federal law. Uh, and so, although there are states that have decriminalized marijuana for certain purposes and purport to be regulating it for either medical purposes or what they call recreational purposes, whatever purposes, it has never been the case that it's legal. And it's very confusing. It's confusing for my teenage daughters when I try to explain this to them. Um, but, but, you know, consider, for example, if, if the federal government decreed that the speed limit were 65 miles per hour and the authorities in Palm Beach uh, didn't like that, and they said, well, you know, on our portion of the highway, the federal highway coming through uh, Palm Beach, uh, the speed limit shall be 85. We won't pursue anybody who goes up to 85 miles per hour. You can say whatever you like, you know, the federal law still rules. That's a rule of law question. Now, somebody's clapping because they agree with me on the policy issue, but I'm speaking to you about the rule of law issue, right? That's the fact. Uh, and so that's the challenge for us. And the thing that the Attorney General has done, while it's consistent with his view and mine, that it's, it's bad as a moral matter, bad as a practical matter uh, to use marijuana, the issue here is that it's simply illegal to do it. And so what the, what the Attorney General has done is simply to say that the Department of Justice has full discretion to enforce the law. It doesn't say which cases we're going to prosecute. He says we're going to treat marijuana just like every other substance. And so an analogy that you might consider uh, is gambling. You know, Congress has decided to leave it to the states to make individual decisions about whether or not to allow gambling. And that's fine. Each state is free to make their decision. They have not made that decision with regard to marijuana. They've decided that it's illegal everywhere. Uh, and so what the Attorney General said, it's not uh, uh, that the policy doesn't dictate that our U.S. attorneys are going to go out and prosecute people for using marijuana. In fact, there are almost no federal prosecutions for uh, mere use uh, or personal possession of marijuana. Our federal prosecutors are busy prosecuting larger scale cases. But what the Attorney General has done in this uh, new policy is simply to say there have been a number of memos written about this by department officials who are trying to grapple with this issue, and they were misinterpreted uh, to suggest that somehow the Department of Justice has overruled the Congress. And what the Attorney General's memo says is that's not the case. Our U.S. attorneys are free to prosecute violations of the law involving marijuana just like uh, all of the substances. And what they're going to do is what they do in all cases, evaluate the facts and circumstances and decide whether a particular case warrants prosecution. So uh, as I said, it's important to distinguish whether you agree with the policy result, marijuana should or shouldn't be legal. Our job in the department is to respect the fact that it is unlawful under federal law. So given that you are on Ken Starr's special counsel team and have dealt with both White House's ability to fight back, Who's better, Clinton or Trump? <laughs> okay, so I did not work on a special counsel investigation. I worked on an independent counsel investigation, and I understand why this is confusing to non-lawyers, but there's a big, big difference to people like me because I believe in the Constitution and the separation of powers, and the independent counsel was an officer appointed by whom? Anybody know who appointed Ken Starr as prosecutor? A federal judge, right? A federal judge appointed Ken Starr because under the independent counsel statute, the independent counsel was not accountable to the Department of Justice, okay? Now, you may agree or disagree with decisions that I make, but I have been appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate to make those decisions, and I am accountable through the political process. A special counsel is appointed by the attorney general or me and has the authority of a U.S. attorney and the accountability of a U.S. attorney. That means if our special counsel were to do something inconsistent with the policies of the Department of Justice, I would have authority to overrule it. If our special counsel or his employees were to violate the rules and regulations of the Department of Justice, 
our inspector general, an officer of professional responsibility, would have authority to investigate and to punish them because they're employees in the Department of Justice. So it's a different animal. Uh, it, it, its goal is the same. The goal is to provide some degree of independence from the uh, traditional, from the typical executive branch processes, but an independent counsel is really independent because there's no accountability. And a special counsel is accountable just like a U.S. attorney. And that to me is a significant difference. And I'm not going to answer the actual question that Tony asked me. <laughs> so you were originally appointed by President Bush. You were one of only three attorneys that President Obama kept on. And now you hold the second highest position in Mr. Trump's Justice Department. What is it about you that <laughs> That people with two different <coughs> world views say, I have to have you on my team. It's nothing personal, Tony, I can assure you that. Um, it, uh, it's funny, I, when I would interview candidates uh, who wanted to be federal prosecutors join the Department of Justice, I would ask them, I always ask people about their career goals to see if they're realistic. And, and one time somebody said, I want to be a U.S. Attorney just like you. And I said, that'll never happen. Because um, that's how I felt. I mean, Bruce knew me when I walked into the Department of Justice 27 years ago, having no real idea of what I was doing. Uh, and I've really just been fortunate. And I think I've been fortunate to be in the right place at the right time and to work with the right people who taught me how to go about exercising this responsibility. And so uh, it's nothing special about me. It's a function of the principles of the Department of Justice. So you're a son, husband, dad, and the number two person running a 100,000 plus government agency. How do you manage stress and how do you find balance yeah. in your life? I'm not running it, the Attorney General is. <laughs> I'm helping to run it. Um, how do I manage stress? I mean, yeah, it's a challenging job, but I'll tell you, it's funny. I, I've known most of the former Deputy Attorneys General uh, and in fact, a couple of them have been colleagues of uh, Bruce's and mine. <clears throat> and I've talked to some of them. In fact, I remember calling one of our former colleagues uh, and I asked him, I said, you know, we were having a challenging issue here in the Deputy Attorney General's office. Uh, where did you leave the manual? <laughs> and unfortunately, there isn't one that, that tells you how to deal with some of these things, but there are always challenging situations that arise. I was talking to Larry Thompson the other day. He was the Deputy Attorney General on September 11th. That was a bad day, you know, far worse than any day that I've experienced the Department of Justice. Uh, and Larry Thompson said, you know, we, had, we didn't know what to do because the Department of Justice on September 11th didn't have a National Security Division. You know, the the anti-terrorism stuff wasn't done by us, uh, and so that was a really challenging and difficult day, and it wasn't just a day, it was years of, of trying to get a handle on this problem and figure out if there are other people out there who are gonna launch similar 9-11 style attacks. Uh, and so you know, there are always challenges that arise in these jobs, but uh, I'm grateful to be here now, and not when Larry Thompson had to make those decisions. Uh, and uh, you know, ha having a, a family and a dog does help alleviate the stress. So given all the information that you've seen with the investigation, do you think you know how it's gonna turn out? <laughs> Is he going to keep this up? <laughs> well, I, I hope uh, I made clear you at did. the beginning, we do not start our investigations with the conclusion in mind. So we have one last question for you, and the college football national championship is Monday. You and the president are the most famous alumni from the University of Pennsylvania. I, I don't Washington, think that's true of me. <laughs> when the two of you see each other, do you talk fighting Quaker football? Ooh. I mean, they did almost win two Ooh. Ivy League championships in a row. Okay. Uh, fighting Quaker is not exactly the way I would be. Quakers don't. <laughs> The President and I are both Quakers, and we don't fight unless it's necessary. Um, but uh, I don't have any opinion about that. I try to stay neutral in all partisan disputes, and that's one of them. Sir, thank you so much thank for you taking the time out of your day to come here and see us. We'll see everybody next week, next month for Acosta.